from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to our continued series entitled uh, Empowering Women, Achieving Human Rights in the 21st Century. On this program, as in previous programs, uh, I have found it a great challenge to know what to say in the resume that it's so long and it's so distinguished. It certainly illustrates the great quality of the guests at this conference and also their graciousness to come and be on our program. We are very honored today to have two guests to continue to discuss this subject. Uh, first of all, welcome to the program, Aravon Frazier. Uh, Ms. Frazier is a senior fellow for the Hubert H. Humphrey Institute at the University of Minnesota. Her duties include serving as the director of the Women Public Policy and Development Program, which is concerned with women's economic uh, status and the contributions of women's organizations uh, to public policy change. She also serves as the director of the International Women's Rights Action Watch, which is a global network uh, that monitors the implementation of the women's human rights agenda now ratified by 122 countries. Uh, our guest has been politically active for many years and she assisted President Jimmy Carter when, when he became president in personnel matters. Uh, she has been an administrative assistant to a congressman. She's run for office herself statewide in Minnesota. And her most recent honor, and it's a very, very important one, and one of the reasons that we're so honored to have her at this conference, she has been appointed by President Bill Clinton as the head of the United States delegation. Mm -hmm to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. And in that capacity over the next few years, she will be doing lots of preparation to head our delegation to the 1995 conference in China on women. And I would like to say to Ms. Frazier that we're delighted that she's here gathering data and also speaking to our conference that she can share on a very much global basis. I've read a lot about you and we're so honored that you have come to Idaho. We welcomed you out to Idaho and this program. I'm delighted to be here. And I'm equally very delighted to have Christina Crawford as a guest today. She too comes with a great long list of credentials and a distinction and has already spoken before the conference and Ms. Frazier will do that tomorrow. Uh, and our guest, uh, Christina Crawford, moved the delegation uh, in a very, very impressive way. She is internationally recognized as a best-selling author and an advocate for the rights of women and for children and she gives great emphasis to both of those issues. She is a very successful businesswoman She's a writer, a producer, a media consultant, uh, an actress, a board member, and a really eloquent speaker. <laughs> Among her books that she's written, the one that will be best known to you is entitled Mommy Dearest, which was on the New York Times bestselling list for 42 weeks. In addition to that, she has written Black Widow and Survivor, and it's my understanding a new book is just coming out. In addition to those impressive credentials, she also received the Sarah Siddons Award as Best Young Actress for her performance in Barefoot in the Park. And she has appeared in over 500 interviews on radio and television, not only in the United States, Europe, uh, South America, and also the Pacific Realm. She is a graduate, uh, magna cum laude, in 1974 from UCLA, and in 1975 she received her master's degree in communications management from the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of, South, of Southern California. Uh, Ms. Crawford, it's a pleasure having you on our program. Thank you. And I certainly don't want to fail to say concerning our other guests that uh, Ms. Frazier is also uh, a graduate in liberal arts with a BA from the Distinguished School of the University of Minnesota. With that introduction, welcome, and I'm delighted Thanks. to have a regular panel of Janelle Burke, an attorney in Idaho, and Steve Schink, the Dean of College Relations and Development with Idaho College, and I shall ask Janelle to commence the questioning. My first question today will be to Christina, and I wondered if you could tell us, as you told the people who attended the Empowering Women Conference, about the role of the oppressor and how oftentimes the oppressor in a human relations situation, in a human rights situation, that oppressor is actually dehumanized. Uh, and perhaps you could include some of your own personal experience in that. Well, what I was speaking about uh, that you're referring to was uh, my growing up. Th my oppressor in this case happened to be the woman that adopted me. And uh, the tragedy was that it was a woman oppressing a woman. Mm -hmm. And what I recognized at a very young age, unfortunately our 
relationship was extremely violent as well as oppressive. Th they can be different, <laughs> um, uh, but in this case, uh, it was the psychological oppression of uh, demeaning and uh, withdrawing any possibility for self-esteem or achievement at the same time uh, of, of experiencing violence, which, which bordered on, on being terrorized. And that's when I said that I feel that we need to pay attention to what we call things. We call what happens uh, in the house domestic violence. In fact, it is terrorism. It has all of the elements of terrorism. What it does is it creates no place of safety, no place to flee, no place to hide, and no place to heal. And that is terrorism. Uh, and uh, when we call it domestic violence, in some way, because domestic means tame and suitable for use in the home, we demean the terror and the violence and in fact relegate it to a place of lesser importance in the way in which we deal with it. And so I advocate removing the word domestic whenever we talk about this issue and calling it instead at least family violence if not household terrorism. And then we begin to understand uh, the, the importance and uh, the, uh, the terror the, the horror of it. What happened in my situation is that uh, the woman who was my oppressor uh, also tried to kill me. And it was a one-to-one -one, uh, battle. Uh, she tried to kill me by choking me. And what I understood in that exchange was that when I saw her face, which was very close to mine, I understood that all humanity had left this human being. It was much more like dealing with some kind of an animal. Uh, the expression in her eyes was one of uh, uh, possession and um, animal instinct. It was a killer instinct. But what I later understood was that she was a person that had tried to succeed in a very difficult uh, world and had been socialized into using all of the tactics of the people that had oppressed her. So we call that internalization of oppression, uh, so that she was not only the victim, but she was also the aggressor and oppressor, and uh, in fact de was dehumanized in the process, and in turn started to dehumanize those in, 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 in her world. Arvon, could you continue on with this? That's a very personal kind of thing. What happens at the international level? Where are we seeing it just wholesale? In well, countries? we're seeing it right now in Bosnia, Somalia, Haiti, Liberia recently, all around the world where those who are trying to maintain power use inhuman means. The story the other day about uh, a recent raid on a village in Bosnia it just shocked us, and yes. it has many analogies. What is so hopeful, though, terrible as that is, is that there are people, like Christina in her case, uh, like the, the Swedish diplomat, I think it was, or investigator, who brought, who documented that a few minutes after it happened got it in this case, where I read it, was the New York Times, but he said he was determined to document this and bring it before the UN War Crimes Tribunal that has already been appointed, but of course hasn't started operating. It takes courageous people to understand what's going on and do something about it. And that, I think, in many ways is the message of this conference. And it's kind of what's happening uh, around the world in a lot of good places. I mean, obviously we've got a lot of terrible things happening. But the good thing is that people are deciding that without any kind of title or authority, they're going to do something about this world. And um, that's what keeps me going. <laughs> Steve Christina, I'd like, we had a wonderful discussion before the show began. I think this is a great point to ask you to, to continue that. 
Uh, Arvon was just talking about what happened recently in Bosnia. Would you tell us a little bit about, about how that is not without historical precedent? Yes. Violence against women and children in particular. Yes. Uh, I was very ill about 10 years ago, and I realized that I needed to connect to my own uh, womanhood and my own sense of spirituality. And that led me through a very long and circuitous uh, course to study women's history. But not, women's hi not history as I had learned it in school or college, but uh, women's history from uh, the, the scholars that are, are surfacing in the women's movement who are going back and re-studying uh, the original documents in the original languages, et cetera, et cetera. And what struck me um, in that process was the, our heritage as European Americans and as Americans, the North and South Americans, are vastly influenced by a period of history that we are never, we, summarily, we are never told the real details about, and that is what is known as the Inquisition. Uh, because everybody has uh, their own beliefs about something called the Inquisition, I renamed it um, and, and took some other people's names for it um, and call it the Burning Times, which gives us, again, an organic uh, understanding of what it was. It started in uh, about 1200, and it, it was a, a direct result of the uh, desire of the Church uh, to control the people, the indigenous people particularly of Europe, Western Europe. And uh, in the cruci Crusades, the, the Crusaders that lived to come back uh, came back with a lot of knowledge that had previously been suppressed by the church in Rome. And it had to do with spiritual practices where the people could relate directly to spirit and they didn't have to go through intermediaries, what you're saying, no, no, no license or permission <laughs> yeah. to, to act. And um, also it had to do with, with awakening of personal um, sensuality. Well, uh, th that w could not be tolerated. And so many of those people, it was the Order of the Knights Templar and they were killed. And that started a movement of oppression uh, by the church about belief systems, and that was called uh, being uh, heretics. In other words, uh, your lifestyle or your belief system did not fit with the, the prescribed church law. But what happened was that it spilled over into uh, suppressing lifestyle and belief system of the indigenous people. Uh, who practiced the old religion, almost intact from the time of the of the goddess area era, where uh, there was a female deity. So the indigenous native people of e Europe and uh, the British Isles still practiced um, earth religion, uh, female-centered uh, ceremonial keepers, healers. Uh, the, they respected women. Women performed uh, the, the duties of midwife, uh, um, foreteller of the future, and uh, healer of the community. And they also kept the, the laws and meted out the, 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 the justice. Well, the church could not uh, convert them, and after a thousand years, they changed their tactics. Having had this great success with uh, killing the heretics and suppressing them, they then turned to the indigenous Europeans and uh, unable to convert them and stop their practice um, and their power, uh, they simply murdered them. And in uh, 1484, uh, Pope Innocent VIII uh, which I find an extraordinary name for this man, uh, declared a new crime uh, uh, in, in civilization, the crime of witchcraft, which meant um, anybody who uh, did not uh, believe the absolute doctrine of the church and adhere to it. Anything else was, um, was to be a witch. And from 1484, to 1834, when the Spanish Inquisition ended officially, between somewhere between 2 million and 9 million women uh, across Europe 
and the British Isles were murdered. There is no other way to say it. They were murdered, and they were murdered for being women, and they were murdered for being healers and benefactors in their community. They were murdered because they had talent, because they were uh, uh, free spirits, because they had uh, power in the community. They were wiped out. There were vil villages in Germany, for instance, where only one elderly woman in the entire village was left to care for the children. The children uh, were, were um, uh, required to watch their mothers being burned at the stake, and then they were left orphans to wander the landscape. I wonder what kind of legacy uh, we have inherited from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also wonder, uh, and it was a, it was a part of the, my remarks, but it is also a part of my personal um, uh, ongoing uh, inquiry, we have a concept from noted psychologist uh, Carl Jung called collective unconscious. And it is my belief that uh, the collective unconscious uh, simply means that because you have, as a group, experienced over a long period of time certain um, um, environmental or psychological uh, experiences, that that is, in effect, imprinted and inherited. Well, what I believe is that the fear, the terror, and the, the annihilation that was real that women experienced for so many years, at least 500 years, that was sanctioned by the church and carried out by the authority of the church and the, and the state, which left women with no property, no dignity, no profession, no power, those that lived has become a part of our collective unconscious. And it is one of the reasons that today w many of us still come from a, a place of deprivation, a place of fear. We are afraid to get up and speak our truth. We are afraid to support Some other life. women. Not all, of course, yeah. but for those women that are, or for those women that are constantly trying to take away or, or be in conflict with other women, that horrible thing about women are their own worst enemies. I believe that that is a direct result of 500 years of, of not only oppression, but murder that was officially sanctioned, and that in, in effect, wiped out our knowledge of ourselves. With that, I think it's a really good time to make a bridge, uh, Christina, to Aravon in relation to her new position to head the uh, United States delegation about what's going on in the world. And could you take us through that? Uh, yeah, I can build on this because what we are doing uh, now is making women's rights human rights. The theory of human rights was first the rights of man emanated in Europe, and literally they meant man, and it has taken us two, three hundred years to include the rights of women. Just this year there was a world conference on human rights in Vienna. Women organized. Women used the violence issue to illustrate uh, the oppression of women. And then, but meanwhile, the Commission on the Status of Women that I uh, sit on and will continue to sit on, had written a document called, that was mentioned in the other program called the Convention and Internationally. Convention means a document, not a meeting. Uh, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It talks about uh, women's right to education, women's right to uh, political equality, right to vote, hold office, right to education, health, employment, to not be discriminated against, uh, a specific article on rural women, but goes in the last two articles to equality under the law and marriage and family law. And in our conferences in the International Women's Rights Action Watch that dealt with these, this convention actually monitors it, we always came back to marriage and family law was sort of the problem. Kind of the family is the mirror of the state, and the man is the head of the household, 
And um, if you buy that, rather than the partnership model of, uh, of marriage, uh, and really of, of, of families as well, um, then you're in trouble politically because if, because the rest of society mirrors that. And so uh, what, um, now the convention does not mention violence. The reason it doesn't, I think, is that at the time it was being written, this was something that still wasn't talked about, mm -hmm. except, you know, hush, hush. I can see when I go through the history of this convention, there were places where women sort of obliquely refer referred to it, and they knew what they were talking about. They never used the term. The terms are very, very new. Uh, but recently, the committee that monitors this treaty interpreted, essentially, the treaty and showed how violence was, was covered. Because there is an article on fundamental human rights and freedoms. Well, if you're the subject of violence, obviously you don't have uh, fundamental human rights and freedoms. Also health, violence is not healthy for you, et cetera, et cetera. What, what's your, your opinion as someone who's deeply involved in what Christine's been talking about uh, as we move towards 95, certainly in, in the World Conference? Uh, I know from what we've heard here and, and I've read that it's different degrees of, of progress or lack of progress in the world. What is your uh, vision for the near future? Oh, my vision, and it got confirmed the other day, is that we have a, um, a worldwide, two worldwide movements. But the good one is a worldwide movement towards, uh, whether you want to call it human rights, democratization, um, development even, and development not in economic terms, but development in, in, in personal and societal and maybe even ethical terms. Uh, we do have that. And, and the other day I had visiting a woman from Zaire. She spoke French and me English, of course, and we had interpreters, but she, and I understand a little French. She talked about the effervescence that is going on in the world, and she meant in the South, this sort of bubbling up from, we might say, the grassroots, um, a sense of people wanting a stake, that they deserve it, that somehow uh, they are somewhat equal. On the other hand, we have those who still want to preach of the idea of domination, of control. And women are central. They've always been central to this because if a man is told he can control his woman, he buys the idea of, of control, and then he can be controlled by others. Uh, and it's a very sort of simple argument, but it's used insidiously both uh, through the um, religious fundamentalists who still sort of, they don't argue the divine right of kings that was, it used to be argued, and the, they argue the, div the divine right, uh, that they are the leaders ordained by God or Allah or whomever, uh, and that they are to control. And, and what they now argue, as somebody says, they tell the, the poor and often the illiterate man don't buy these Western ideas. They're evil of women's liberation and of equality. And uh, so I think we see this head-on collision in a lot of countries where it's, where it's violent with guns. But we also see this demand for a new kind of world. Uh, we see rulers overthrown. We're in, a, we're in a real time of transformation. Thank you. Janelle Berg. I'm going to ask some very quick questions because we're almost out of time, unfortunately. But let's start with Christina, and I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to say witchcraft, that brings to mind women. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about the freckles and, and blemishes on the face? Sure. Um, there, if no other charges could be brought against a woman, in other words, she had medieval anything times. Wrong. Yes, uh, during uh, the time of the Inquisition, the burning times. There were two other ways that uh, she could be condemned. And one was if she had any 
facial blemish of any sort, a, a freckle, a mole, a wart, um, a birth uh, mark, anything like that. And it was said that uh, she was then uh, kissed by Satan or the devil. And and I I bring it to the to the uh, present and say, you know, we we are all crazed about having perfect faces, <laughs> you know, and we'll spend all Not this money on on cosmetics or or plastic surgery or all that. I mean, that's all craziness. Uh, but it 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 has it has some meaning if you if you go behind and that's that's one of the ways that history can help us the other was um, it, there, there were uh, uh, the way that uh, uh, a woman could be exposed as, as such was um, if she did not bleed when pricked by a needle and um, there was a profession uh, in those times uh, called prickers and they went from town to town um, sticking needles in uh, women that were uh, stripped naked to the waist in, in public squares. And if the woman did not bleed, because they had retractable needle tools, so they could determine, the, these men could determine whether or not a woman was going to bleed when stuck supposedly with the needle. And they got paid, these, these prickers, um, by the, number the, the number of women that were, that were accused. And today, the, the language, the slang word, is, is simply slang for reprehensi re reprehensible behavior. But at that time, it was actually a profession. And so that leads us to where are we going in the future? That's our history, but we're going forward, right, Arvon? Uh, we are, I think, uh, because as I said earlier, there is this sort of demand for equality, for democracy, for democratization, and a sense on the part of people to use their own strength, their minds, um, their abilities. I think there's a turning away by many from violence, from domination, uh, sort of domination towards partnership. I, I would just like to say, I know that we have no time, but there is a person running for political office in the state of Virginia today who is running on a, a religious right oh, platform. Lots of places. And his statement uh, is that women become hysterical when faced with authority. Um, in terms of our history, uh, there's Still ample there. reason to be hysterical when faced <laughs> with authority, but the same person has advocated that the works Cinderella and the Wizard of Oz be banned from school because they portray witches as being good. That is today. On that note, we'll have a we'll perfect conclusion. I wish we had a lot more time. On behalf of the panel and our staff, we want to thank uh, Christina Crawford and Arvon Frazier for your very eloquent words. It's been a very powerful series. and. Uh, we're happy you came to Idaho, and of course, in case of Christina now living in Idaho. I live in Idaho. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for being with us. Delight. Ladies and gentlemen, I, we know that you have enjoyed this program and that uh, it continues to be of great importance and interest to you, and we'd like to invite you to be with us again next week when we continue this series. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>